Hi, guys. Welcome back to the Chris and Jesse show with Chrissy and Jess. I'm Chrissy. And I'm Chris. Uh, oh, weird. It's not Jess. No, I'm much, no. much handsomer. Um, much bigger boobs, too. <laughs> and I'm not even <laughs> going to dispute that. Uh, so tonight, um, unfortunately, Jess is not joining us. She is in the background, though, because we have a special interview with Vermin Supreme. Um, Jess works for the National Party, like everyone knows. And um, because of that, we didn't want libertarians to get all salty about um, her being able to interview a presidential candidate. Wait a minute. Are you saying libertarians are a-holes? Can we curse on this, by the way? Yes. We, assholes. They are assholes. assholes. They are dick cunt bitches. Dick. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. I just, you know, I'm a guest. I don't want to... I don't want to offend or anything. Yeah, no, they're kind of dick I'm bitches. Trying. Um, they are always trying to bully people. So we're trying to kind of uh get away from bullying Jess. Uh so instead of her doing the interview tonight, Chris is going to. So you get to look at two of the biggest boobs in podcast history. No bigger boobs in the entire libertarian movement than these two. <laughs> So, um, Chris Spangle, uh, he actually hosts um, We Are Libertarians. He has like a whole podcast, a uh, little enclave thing with a bunch of podcasters in it. However, he has not added the Chris and Jesse show. Well, I'm willing to deal. So what can you bring me? It's like a dowry. You know, I need goats if you want to be on my network. It's a very valuable network. It's it's huge. Uh, with Brian Nichols show and Trisha Stewart man with the gingerarchy and we are libertarians and uh, boss hog of let's see all, it goes on and on and on. You know, Renzo Martinez just joined us. What can you bring to me? Um, have you not seen my million dollar smile? It's pretty nice, actually. Yeah, very white teeth. How did you get your teeth so white? Um, it's a lot of bleach. Stick your tongue out. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's it's there. nice. It's my son's birthday, and we had birthday cake, and it literally dyed my tongue blue. Um, but it matches my background because I'm actually in the future, while Chris is in the past. Because as many people know, Vermin Supreme is a time traveler. So oh, yes, we we wanted to make him feel comfortable. Um, I'm wearing my Team Supreme shirt. So, and this is actually an interesting uh, duo that we have interviewing Vermin tonight because I am on Team Supreme. That is my man. And Chris is a little whiny bitch. I don't get it at all. I mean, <laughs> really, I don't. Uh, I'm sure he's a very nice man, and I look forward to speaking with him, but I don't get it at all. I don't get it at all. See, look at me. Now, now I'm bullying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not bullying. You run for office prepared to get bullied, sir. <laughs> um, you want to run so, against Donald Trump and not get bullied? Okay. Right. <laughs> So, uh, Chris, how has coronavirus been affecting you? Yeah, like everybody, I have my good hours and my bad hours. You know, it's like you wake up and you feel sorry for yourself and you cry at videos of old ladies screaming on their porch. Give me a hug. Like <laughs> and, and then you you get up and you like read something about food, food lines and food pantries and you go, I am so blessed you know, it's just, there's it's really an extraordinary time to like live through. There's nothing that I think we will ever live through that will compare with like this month. That hopefully this is the worst of it, that it never gets any worse than this in terms of the virus or the economic fallout. But it's truly one of the it's just a roller coaster of emotion. Like I think everybody feels some level of grief and loss. And that's as little as, you know, I can't get my hair cut. This isn't fair to you know my mom is a nurse in the rn in the in the icu and like that is terrifying and so you know it just goes from and then there's like i'm so glad i got to stay home today and i get to like walk in the back porch and look at the sunshine and isn't this better than seeing my coworkers? so there's just like there's it's just so odd i don't know i have so many feelings and i can't handle it well yeah that's uh i think that's pretty much the typical response everyone's having uh it's it's been yeah it's been sad it's been happy i'm just happy that i paid my rent you know there's lots of people who aren't even able to do that 
Yeah, like my my work stuff is stable. I mean, that's okay. Like, are you okay? Like, is have you been on furloughed or anything like that? I am a bartender. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so. I I am have probably missed out on about five grand uh, oh, right wow. now. I make I make about uh, anywhere between thousand and fifteen hundred a week. Um, unfortunately though, I am a bad, bad girl and I don't claim my tips. So unemployment is giving me $110 a week. <laughs> See, <laughs> you, you try to be libertarian in one area and it screws you when you want to be a statist in another. Yeah, it's bullshit. Let <laughs> me be a statist and give me my money. It's my oh. money and I want it now. I'm calling JG Wentworth. <laughs> well, I wouldn't do that. He seems like a very expensive usury type fellow. But <laughs> my thing with unemployment is like you do pay into it. Your employer pays into it. So it doesn't it's not like, you know, it's not like the bailout money where it's just uh, straight up tax money. But, you know, where the printer's going. Burr, but uh, I, yeah. I don't blame you at all for filing for unemployment. My dad um, actually the other day was like, where are they going to get all this money? I'm like, they're literally printing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're <laughs> That's not where. They're it's literally great. just printing the money. And I don't think people have any clue what that means. Like <laughs> yeah. they, they don't understand what that means for their financial future in like 20 years. It's like, yeah, a car is going to be $50,000 for 2007 Datsun. Yeah. I was trying to explain, you know, uh, how luckily my son's kids get to pay it back. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Chris, on this show, um, which is tonight, the Chris and Chrissy show. Uh, we like to talk about things we hate because we hate everything. So what are a couple of things that you really, really just have to get off your chest? Man, there's so many things I hate. You invited the right person to be a co-host tonight. Um, I was driving. That's right. I left the house yesterday I'm and I was driving past a playground and there was that orange fencing, construction fencing around a child's playground in a park in Greenwood, Indiana. And I just went, the sunlight kills the virus. What are we doing? Let people out. You're just shoveling them all into a store. And there's 75 people in line at Bob Evans. I swear there were like the entire parking lot of Bob Evans was full. So none of this, it's none of it's working. Like everybody's out. Let's just everybody get back to your life. Just if you, if you're not going to follow the social distancing rules, just, suffer the consequences i guess but uh yeah i i hated seeing that it just it ticked me off like i am i am not a libertarian who doesn't understand biology like i'm a libertarian who believes that you should stay at home quarantine yourself social distancing voluntarily like i've been on that train from the beginning and i i don't understand how many so many this is the other thing i hate how so many libertarians cannot do not have the cognitive function to separate biology and liberty. They can be two separate things. So you you don't need the government to voluntarily shelter at home. And if I say I want to shelter at home because I think it's the right thing to do to stay at home, it doesn't mean I'm for I'm for government shutdowns. And there's a lot of people that don't seem to get that. So I hate that too. <laughs> Wait, no, you're saying libertarians are like that? I think there's a lot of people in the libertarian movement who or conservative movement. There's a lot of talk radio hosts or TV show hosts who, instead of looking up information, would rather make up conspiracy theories about death counts and then publish fake hypothetical situations like the Ron Paul Institute about the death counts. When if you pick up a phone call and you call a doctor, they they tell you I literally called someone at the CDC to this and I said, please explain this to me like I'm five, like. Where is Fauci fudging the death count numbers? And they said, no, it's up to literally every doctor, individual doctors fill out the death certificates and then turn it in. And then we gather that information. And so you're telling me that the incentive structure, libertarian economists haven't figured out the incentive structure of that. And we're claiming that thousands of doctors are just fudging the numbers for what? what what's the incentive there? Just to lose their license for fun? So it, I think there's a lot of, like, I'm just... My show is called We Are Libertarians, Chrissy, and I want to change the name every fucking day. <laughs> I don't get it. I'm just very I've, I'm sitting in this apartment boiling and, and mad at my own people. And I hate that I feel that way. But it's like just Google some shit before you post it. Like what? Yeah, Just Google. It's not hard. I yeah. do it all the time. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I'm 
I, I'm getting a little fed up with libertarians, but I also love my people, and that's why I just get mad. You know, yeah. they're, they're the most generous people. They're the most giving people. It's just they get online and they're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like they're like totally, completely cool, like in person, and then they get online, and it's like, where did you go? Like, how, right. what happened to you? Yeah, like, yeah. but I get it. I th I think like it, it's a hard time to be a libertarian because on one hand you have like the most oppressive local state and federal actions in our lifetime. Yeah. So that just makes you crazy and you hate that. But then at the same time, it's like, you've got some of the best examples of libertarianism to talk about ever. And like the testing issue, instead of a hundred points of failure and success in testing, the CDC centralized it to one point of failure and they failed. <laughs> so the, like there's a great argument to be made that we're sheltering in our houses because the government failed and so there's you know we don't need government action because the nba and the ncaa were sheltering in place and voluntarily shutting down my company started voluntarily shutting down before the government got involved the government was late i mean as always they were react reactionary so you've got all these great examples of libertarianism and how how our ideas work and how their ideas fail along with like the most oppressive, like sucks to live under this, you know, regime. Uh, so it, it is, it's, it factors in, it's just kind of like, mm. <laughs> well, luckily we got out all of that hate before we bring on. There's Vermin more inside. Love. Yeah. There's lots of, there's a lot of it inside. Well, luckily uh, Vermin Supreme's uh, middle name is actually love. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So um, I think that we're going to just go ahead and bring them on. So we have <laughs> we have Vermin Supreme with his pony and his mask. And we have Spike Cohen with his really horrible haircut. My haircut um, was fun. No, my haircut was fine. I just can't. I just can't get my haircut for like five weeks. Can we zoom in on Spike's? Terrible no, hair. No exotic haircut from prison. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even I know. Can't, I'm sorry for bullying you, but come on, man. I can't tell no, what's it's worse. Terrible. The, it's terrible. The chest hair or the, the head hair? I like the chest you, hair. You mean which is better? <laughs> my luxurious chest mane or, or my equally luxurious unkempt hair? Look at Vermin with his. Is that is that a, a mask made out of ties, Vermin? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I actually, uh, I have. Uh oh. Oh, Vermin's muted. I can't <laughs> hear you, Verm. Gosh, God damn it! Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, this is a uh, yes. It's a, a it's a good uh, mask. It's a solid mask. A lot of people have a lot of neckties around the house, and you might need it to help protect you. It, it's also a good uh, Cthulhu thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have uh, my Vernon Supreme tie. Um, I didn't realize I could wear it as a mask as well. Yes, that. yes. That that very glitter necktie could save your life it's very fashionable Sorry. all right guys so let's just jump into the meat of this here um so as a lot of people know vermin supreme is running for president as a libertarian um the man next to him is spike cohen he is running as a for uh his vice president um yeah i don't know which side it's on it's on one of these sides um so both of these gentlemen are absolutely fantastic i love them so much and we we're really excited to bring them on and kind of uh, talk with them a little bit. So my very first question um, is for Vermin, um, but Spike, feel free to interject. Um, so Vermin, you ran for president as a Democrat previously, and you have a lot of left-leaning support. Um, how do you think the Libertarian Party and Libertarian candidates in general can attract more of uh, pro more progressives and more well, left-leaning? I'm, I'm going to take that as a two-part question. Uh, because that slanderous lie uh, <laughs> that I have been a Democrat is uh, needs to be addressed flat out. Um, yes, it is true that I have run as a Democrat, but the fact of the matter is I never was a Democrat. I was never active 
in the Democratic Party or anything of the sort. So, so that, that's simply a misnomer. Um, and of course, uh, many Democrats, uh, it, it depends once again, because there's a, a lot of Democrats, as I've discovered, and uh, ultimately the litmus test is how they react to uh, my hardcore harassment of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, earlier in this uh, election cycle up in the New Hampshire primary and, and uh, the first week in November, which was the period for filing up there, um, totally mixed it up uh, with, with, the, with the Biden people. And they were just hating me, hating me, hating me hard. Uh, the, the Warren supporters were hating me, hating me, hating me hard. Uh, but on the other hand, the Tulsi supporters uh, were very much uh, amendable to me. Uh, the Yang supporters were very much uh, favorable in my direction, as were the, the Bernie supporters. Uh, so obviously the, the, the Democrat, Democratic Party itself uh, is not, uh, not a monolith, uh, apparently. Um, although monoliths are super cool, aren't they? <laughs> um, and the second part, of course, is uh, how can we uh, attempt to attract um, left uh, left leaners uh into our direction and i believe that is simply to buy to be able to continue uh what we have been do uh, doing which is uh contrasting the, the full-on failure of the governments and uh co concentrating on the uh, the venn diagram overlaps uh that we uh, possess uh when i was up in uh, once again during the primary when i uh, asked Tulsi if she had uh, read the libertarian platform she had not but she responded uh, with a very impassioned uh, rant about uh, the war and ending the wars and being against the wars and uh, civil liberties, uh, so right off of, right off the bat, there are two you know very strong uh, agreements that we have, and I believe that uh, it's uh, simply incumbent upon us once again to to continue to show the uh, fallacies inherent in uh, this the belief that the government uh, is going to know what's best for you and act in your best interest. And uh, and uh, simply deconstruct and put forth uh, the arguments and the statistics uh, that uh, that put into question uh, claims uh, such as uh, you know gun control and stuff and, and the the need for it. I mean and uh, uh, and uh, offering libertarian uh, solutions. Uh, you know, I mean once again, I mean I was asked that very question on my. Uh, my uh, evening podcast, which is called uh, Chilling by Some Nice Spot with Vermin. And um, <laughs> it, uh, it, it airs about 5, 5.30 on uh, Facebook Live uh, pretty much every day. And uh, every day I try to take the people to a, a different nice uh, moving water, ideally, or just some chill spot, nature sounds. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's not very It is must-see TV. It's it not very works. political. I guess it's part of that slow TV movement almost. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, somebody did question about you know my stance on M for four because uh, currently um, there's a, a huge uh, uh, tsunami, if you will, of uh, of Bernie supporters looking for a place to land, and many of them are very predisposed to uh, to myself and and uh, what I've been doing and, and what I represent and all of these things, and uh, they seem to understand that yes, I, I'm running in the Libertarian Party, and so you know they but. Once again, I maintain that the kids are politically flexible, they, or poly flexible, as, as they may say, and um, uh, essentially they are looking for solutions. They're young, uh, they are open, and they are going for. They're looking for what makes sense to them. And when they hear things like, you know, everybody should be covered by health care, I mean, they they say yes, that that sounds great. Of course they should. I mean, what? Why shouldn't they? And uh, so it's it's a matter for us. To explain to them why that is a completely inefficient and uh, overreaching uh, concept that can, uh, whose goal, uh, healthcare for all or affordable, accessible healthcare for all, can indeed be met uh, through a variety of other measures, uh, of uh, uh, often uh, including deregulation of the current uh, system and, and things of that nature that would uh, make the whole uh, medical industrial complex uh, uh, more. Uh, affordable thing i mean shit medicare they they pay pennies on the dollar and uh to the hospitals and that's why the hospitals have to jack up uh, the prices uh through the roof uh, i mean uh, that's why they're charging so much for your uh you know your aspirin or, or something like that uh because they have to compensate for the fact that they're only gonna get paid uh you know 
X and X percent on the uh, on the dollar. So there's that, and just continually making these uh, uh, these arguments about uh, you know subscription uh, healthcare services and uh, I mean I just point you know and once again I think we we're, we're you know always looking for ideas we're always trying to open and expand uh, the the possibilities. Um, of course, Bernie pulled them way in one direction, but once again, it was this you know utopian vision of the of uh, free healthcare and free college and ponies, and uh, um, we have to pull it back a little bit, or, or you know make make them understand that it's just not a not a realistic thing to do. So, is it a matter of connecting with people on because I'm I'm not a left libertarian, and I, I come from the right, and I tend to my that's where my bias falls. So I, I don't necessarily sure. have. Uh, not experienced in dialoguing with people that may come from the left, other than hardcore Democrats, which I'm not going to win over, anyways. No, screw, screw the Dems. Yeah, right. So when you're talking <laughs> to people, is it a matter of connecting on saying yes, I agree with you on the problems. We agree on the problems. We differ on the solutions, and this is the path that we ought to go. Absolutely. Is that I, where I, I start? I, yes, I, I, I think so. Um, it, it was a fun little th uh, trick that. Uh, uh, Larry Sharp played at, at when uh, one event I was at. It was like, you know, how many people are here are you know against universal health care? And like everybody rose their hand and started booing it and stuff. Or, or and but they said, no, no, no. Think about it. I mean, we're not against universal health care per se. No, we are against the government being involved in it. And so it's a matter of uh, finding uh, reasonable uh, solutions that uh, that we can present. I mean, uh, you know, and, and once again, I, you know, I was pointing out the, you know, up until uh, 1964, I think this was a, something that I picked up at one libertarian convention or another, you know, that uh, med medical uh, services were a cash based uh, operation, total, total cash based up until 64. And then, of course, in uh, it, uh, it was a nonprofit uh, operation up until 1972, uh, when Nixon decided that the uh, it, it should beca become a, a, a profit industry. And then obviously it, it become uh, industry maximized their profits and uh, did what they could do and, uh, and continue to do so. So there's that. Um, you know, these are just things that we have to consider when we, uh, once again, I mean, people are always wondering why are things the way they are? And it's so much easier uh, to uh, understand that, you know, in this world where we exist right now, the government is in charge and so it's very easy for people to assume that that is where all the solutions are. And so, yes, it is incumbent upon us to attempt to address their concerns uh, with libertarian solutions. Well, and, and let's talk about why they uh, are going towards someone like Bernie in the first place. You look at Bernie's voters, they're very similar to Vermin supporters. They skew very young, very young. And, and a lot of them tend to, it, it, these are people that have been left behind. They've been told a lie from since they were kids that, you know, you go to college and get an education and you're you're going to be able to pull yourself up your, by your bootstraps by everyone else. What no one told them is that thanks to decades of terrible central planning, that's increasingly impossible for most kids who aren't already upper middle to upper income bracket in their in their household. So they come out of school now. They're an ungodly amount in, in debt already. Um, <laughs> and I mean, they can't even get insurance in their own name yet. Uh, or, or, or they can't rent a car in their own name yet, but they can have, you know, a quarter of a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars in, in debt for a job that is they're, they're not even able to get. So now they're working in the in the service industry with, you know, six figures of, of or high five figures of student debt. Uh, you know, when they talk to their parents or grandparents about it, they're told about stories about how they were able to work their way through college back when it cost a, a fraction of what it does now, thanks to the terrible policies that their parents and grandparents voted for. And then here comes this, you know, benevolent looking old man to say, well, I'm going to tax the wealthy and give you all the stuff that you need. And, and when, you know, their parents and grandparents say they can't do that, they're destroying free market capitalism. To them, that's great, good. If this is free market capitalism, which it isn't, but if that's what this is, let's destroy it and let's tax grandma and grandpa and 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 you know get me and and, and the wealthy corporations and the, and the wealthy people and and get me the things that I need because I've been lied to the whole time. This entire system has left me behind. What a perfect opportunity for libertarians to get over ourselves maybe once or twice and actually talk to them and listen to what they have to say and instead of screaming at them that healthcare is not a right, talk to them about what their actual concerns are. And uh, and and be able to 
to uh, message to them the, <laughs> the fact that this system has left them behind and it's left them behind precisely because of terrible central planning from Republicans and Democrats. And that, you know, the and, and that we as libertarians uh, present not just a viable alternative as a third party, but as a completely different alternative, a di completely different way of looking at the nature of whether the government should even exist in the first place. And if it should, then what it should be providing and, 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 and how it's done a terrible job of providing it thus far and why it's done a terrible job of providing it thus far. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of Bernie supporters, I see it every day on Twitter that they're saying, at least for now, they're voting for Vermin as a, as just a protest, a big, you know, F you to the whole system. But that's an opening for us to have a dialogue with them about what libertarianism actually is. Make no mistake, most of these kids are, they support vermin and they either don't know about libertarianism or they're actively opposed to it. And here is an opportunity, but, th but they'll vote for a libertarian candidate if it's vermin. So here's a great opportunity to get votes that no other candidate could get and to open the door for an entire generation of voters who will be voting and making, helping make policy decisions long after all of us are dead. I mean, some of these kids are going to be doing it 70, 80 years from now. So what an amazing opportunity we have. I actually um, prefer a different method of communication. I like calling them cucks and snowflakes. <laughs> No, there's always room for that there's always room i like for that. that i like that too have you thought about outreach to simps <laughs> <laughs> outreach for simps i think is really an untapped resource she'll, uh, on she'll our date instagram, you if you vote for vermin we got tons of simps on the wall instagram i'm just saying that might be a goal so i i kind of hear it through the thread of both of what you're saying I'm shaking my head as if though i know what that term refers to of course oh it, i love it it is the new version of cuck simp is like a uh -huh. a a weak beta male who just is friend known hard or simpleton uh, when I was a kid. <laughs> so this is this is what a perfect opportunity to say she'll date you if you vote for Vermin. That's right. Like, that's well, I, I am trying to forge that that uh, incel uh, sex worker alliance. Uh, you know, I can work very hard on that. I uh, feel like if you went with the slogan "Vote for Vermin" at twenty five percent testosterone increase might be a, a good selling point. Add that to the pony thing. <laughs> you can have a beard like vermin or chest hair like Spike. <laughs> you vote for vermin today and buy our exciting supplement, our male enhancement supplement. Oh, man. Can we have a male enhancement supplement? Yeah. I, just, I feel like he just channeled Alex Jones. A little bit. No, a little I, bit, yeah. Like he was in the room. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, hearing, I'm hearing from both of you that like empathy is central to it. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just, just, I mean, I, I've always been of the opinion that just because somebody has a differing opinion, they are not my ideological enemy. Wrong. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna kill you. I'll boy. destroy you. You may be older than me, but boy, what a simp. <laughs> No, you're the simp, bro, and I mean that like simpleton. <laughs> so, guys, um, I know that you both have um relationships, but we never really get to hear about Vermin's. Um, we hear a little bit about Spike's way too hot for him wife. Um, I am so I am an attractive, and and I'm a get. I'm a, I'm a I'm a oh, big. Yeah. I'm a. <laughs> So, um, can you guys? Well, I'm a, a DILF, little... and that is part of my appeal, from what I understand. <laughs> <laughs> or GILF. I'm sorry, I'm a GILF. And, uh, so tell us about your partner, Vermin. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, uh, Becky has, is my wife of some 30 years now. Uh, okay. we met on a peace march in Michigan, uh, shortly after I uh, left Baltimore and uh, joined the uh, peace group, the Seeds of Peace. Uh, we were doing uh, support for mobile protests. Uh, the group had a porta potty and uh, a, a truck with a half a dozen porta potties. It had a kitchen trailer. It had a, a 2,500 gallon water trailer, and uh, it was a spinoff of the Great Peace March, which was a peace march that came from L.A. to D.C. I guess I'm giving a little too much detail on the pre. Uh, Tell us more about the porta potty. Uh, well, they were very nice. we were able to decorate them. Uh, we I totally decorated them and made them uh, very very exciting for the people. Dif different theme ones. Uh, they they were like, uh, yes, clean and friendly. I might add, but we were in charge of that sort of thing, uh, helping move these things. And I was we were driving through Michigan. I think it was uh, either Kalamazoo and on our way to Lansing or something like that. 
And uh, oh, I don't know. I, I saw saw Becky. Saw saw this uh, very attractive uh, young peace marcher, and I was a virile young person, and I just took a little shining uh, to uh, her, and uh, well, you know, uh, we, we hooked up, and uh, then we. Uh, uh, she had a vehicle at the time, and we, we drove to uh, Massachusetts. She offered me a ride, uh, and so that was a, a very beautiful thing. And uh, then we traveled America for three years uh, in a vehicle with a, a little cab over uh, camper, and we did uh, political activism. From uh, We would uh, sort of travel from uh, down south, from the Kings Bay, Georgia, where they uh, had the nuclear weapons deployed, to... Cape uh, Canaveral, Florida, where they testing the Trident uh, D5 missiles, and we uh, uh, held down the fort for some friends of ours who were uh, in jail for a, a simple crossing the line uh, down there, Cape Ann, uh, I mean Cape Canaveral Action Committee or some such, and the Nevada nuclear test site. We would uh, spend uh, weeks or months out there, and we sort of traveled the country clockwise for about three years uh, following these different political actions and visiting our kinfolk, hers in Michigan and mine in Massachusetts. And one year um, we were doing temp work uh, wherever we were, uh, you know, doing whatever we could find. And she was doing some substitute teaching and a local Head Start offered her uh, the opportunity to do some uh, teaching. Uh, they didn't want to hire as a sub, but they would have hired her full time. And that led to us moving to here in Cape Ann, and we found this beautiful little uh, house in the woods with the incredibly cheap rent, and uh, we've been here for 30 years, and uh, she is not into the limelight. Uh, she is uh, uh, is not into, uh, you know, she, she's, she's played out on my campaign, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> they usually are. They sure. usually are. First few oh. years, she was, you know, more more excited by it. Uh, but she has tolerated uh, what I have been doing, and she's been extremely, extremely tolerant when it comes to this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, libertarian campaign run. Uh, you know, for uh, months at a stretch, I was gone every weekend, you know, for several months in a row uh, doing the debates at the state conventions and like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, you know, it, and that took a while, took some adjustment, you know, I mean, sure. And uh, but it got to the point where she realized that if she kept herself busy, she wasn't so pissed at me for being gone. And um, yeah, so she, she's a uh, she understands she, she puts in the context that I am I am following my bliss and uh, she has allowed me to do that. And I'm very appreciative of that. And uh, we have a, a, a wonderful relationship. She's one of the sweetest women I've ever met in my life. She's an incredibly sweet lady. I love Becky. And I will say, on you know, on the streets when we when when we're protesting on the streets, you know, and when she does accompany me, because she's more than likely to, she'll attend the uh, street political demonstrations more so than uh, uh, the Liberty conventions. <laughs> but she has I'm a very, yeah, uh, she she has a, a really solid uh, knack of being able to be exceptionally situationally aware of what's going on and pays attention to the cop behavior. And so if I'm like up front doing something wacky, uh, you know, she will she'll be the one who notices if the white uh, shirt uh, people, the cops who are in charge start to huddle with their troops. And, you know, she can tell if something's going to happen. And oftentimes she will go up and in enter uh, spurs and she will talk to the head cop and interface with the head cop and say, oh, no, that's just vermin. He's a clown. Don't worry about him. And uh, and has saved my ass on several occasions. Nothing says true love like swine control. Absolutely. <laughs> Meanwhile, so. um, when I got pulled over, um, my husband told the cop that the pipe was mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's the difference between Brandon and Becky. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what? They were going to charge you anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, well well my wife i that's a that's quite a segue um my uh my wife would never do that uh <laughs> my wife when she gets pulled over um she yells at the cop and explains that uh america should be using kilometers like every other civilized country <laughs> and um that's and then area then and she she yeah and she hands them a, 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 a ontario 
a Canadian driver's license and they look at it and they get flustered and she yells at them and then, and then literally peels off. Like I've been <laughs> there. So she, she deals with police slightly differently. She condescends them and then drives off real fast and they leave her alone because they don't want to do the paperwork. My wife is a beautiful goddess of a woman uh, who I am completely deserving of because I am also an attractive man. Uh, we uh, just recently celebrated our 10th wedding anniversary. Um, we met uh, 13 years ago and uh, she came here uh, from uh, beautiful, beautiful Toronto, came down as soon as she saw me at the airport, realized that I was her future and that she could never do any better than this, including <laughs> my haircut and um, and especially my haircut. And um, and because my hair looks way better if I can get it cut. Um, I'm I'm not over the haircut thing, but uh, she is uh, she's an amazing woman. Uh, I have uh, she's she is very much like a, a Becky in that she doesn't like to be in the limelight and uh, has also been incredibly tolerant of my campaigning. Um, so yeah, no, I uh, I absolutely love her and adore, her, and uh, I uh, I have nothing but good things to say about her and um. Yeah, she's not she's not a libertarian, but she her her way of of de-escalating cops by escalating uh, to the point where they <laughs> back off is is something I've never beheld any other person be able to do without getting tased. So, <laughs> <laughs> like they get mad, they get up, they go, "I'm ma'am, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry." And she's like, "Well, next time, don't bother people." And then she drives. I mean, <laughs> she's, she's absolutely incredible. <laughs> So, um, to kind of, let's see, um, Chris, you were supposed to ask the next one. Is it my turn? Well, so I'm going to continue in the serious vein, if you don't mind, Chrissy. Go ahead. Skip my fucking questions. Fuck. All right. <laughs> Get these, this, I, you know, it's not that I don't care about your favorite snack as a kid, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, that was literally the question. <laughs> yeah. We've got presidential candidates here. So. I'm, I'm going to give people what they want. Boxers. I'm, I'm, wear, I'm wearing briefs and boxers. I'm wearing boxers over my briefs, over my panties. <laughs> I, I, I did inhale. I did inhale. <laughs> I'm, told, I'm inhaling right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I've been involved in the Libertarian Party since 2007, 2008. Like a lot of people, I've put in a lot of time, a lot of effort. Uh, I, I look at... I, I ran Rupert for governor, his campaign, the good survivor guy. And we were very cognizant of the fact that people looked at a guy who was a reality TV star and, and dressed in tie dye and had a big beard. We were very cognizant of how the public perceived Rupert, even though he was a very serious candidate and a very um, qualified candidate for the office. We ran into a tremendous amount of trouble just based on his physical appearance and just the, the sideshow of it all. And I think there's a lot of people, myself included, who look at the boot on the head and the performance art and go, I've worked a long time for the party. I've got a lot invested in this. And I don't want to hand it over to somebody who's going to make a mockery of all this and make a mockery of the electoral process, especially when we've got two, again, two of the worst candidates ever. So what, what do you say to those delegates who are going to go into the next convention and vote on your candidacy who have that same kind of feeling of, I'm really worried about the public perceiving you as a joke, even though you're a perfectly lovely man and you're very intelligent, this is the first time I'm enjoying our conversation, not many voters are going to take the opportunity to ever engage. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't taken that, that time to investigate your candidacy because of the sideshow aspect and the ponies and all of that stuff. So what do you say to that? Well, I, I say, number one, that's, that's rather unfortunate. Uh, number two, uh, worst uh, two candidates in our lifetime. That was certainly uh, true of the last time also. Um, and I think that you have to, uh, I'm sure that you've heard my uh, suggestion and my inoculation for the Libertarian Party itself. For me, and I understand the question is, uh, you know, can a serious party put up a perceived joke candidate and not have that stick to them? And I totally believe that the answer is 100% yes. It's absolutely in the framing. And that framing is something along the lines of 
Yes, we are the Libertarian Party. Yes, we are a very serious party, and we've been working on many serious things, and we have some very serious solutions for the uh, ails of society, and we uh, intend on pre presenting them. However, in the pivot, the pivot's very important, um, electoral politics, the duopoly, and essentially, especially the presidential election cycle has risen to the level of a joke and with love and with spite. Here is Vermin Supreme. <laughs> and, uh, and the, I love a good spite candidate. I'm going to be honest with you. Oh, this is pure spite. This whole thing is pure spite. Hashtag we are in on the joke or in on the joke inoculates the party against it of, of the accusation of being the joke. It's essentially the party is owning the joke. Yes, I'm not saying that uh, the joke is not part of and parcel of the presentation. Of course. I mean, what I am offering, uh, what I have been pointing out is that I have been spending 30 years running the satirical uh, campaign, but that has given me a level of notoriety and name recognition, political goodwill, um, and th things of that nature. And that is what I am bringing to the table. Part, you know, yes, the character, yes, uh, the, plat the, the wacky platform planks. However, there is that pivot every time. And I'm sure you've been seeing. Um, the, the live debates where I'm presenting the issues. And yes, I, I do that with, with funny, a, a zinger, one liner, and then pivot right to um, the real deal, uh, right. the platform. I mean, I have been presenting the Libertarian Party platform as my own platform uh, since the inception of this campaign. I believe firmly that if you are going to represent a party or shill for a party, then you need to represent uh, to the public what that party stands for. And I believe that is clearly uh, encapsulated in the platform itself. And so I, if you go to my website, vermintspring2020.com, it is there. So yes, there is the policy platforms, which are somewhat fanciful, uh, may include concentration camps for the kids. <laughs> um, but then there is this, you know, hard pivot. pivot. And, and uh, another thing, of course, is my satire. Um, my presentation, I believe personally that most people get it. When I'm talking about the mandatory toothbrushing laws, people get it. The word, the phrase free pony is a phrase that I have introduced into the American political lexicon using uh, the, my communication strategy. You know, I, when I brought that into, into being, it was a campaign promise and then it became public. And now it's commonly thrown around uh, everywhere for what exactly it means for, for a giveaway. So the satire I have always felt is, is pretty clear. And I think it addresses a, uh, most of the, the shortfalls in the government and society. And I've been happily presenting it to the people as a eye-opening experience. Um, and now I, I understand people's concerns and reservations as, as very well they, they should have them, but I can only hope to allay them uh, by the, myself that I am in the knowledge. And once again, it, it's just an offer that I am making, that I'm putting on the table to the Libertarian Party. It is just one way to go it is one option granted it is not orthodox no not at all but perhaps it is time to move beyond the politics of respectability perhaps it is time to move uh, beyond such timidness and just go for you know go for the juggler go for the balls you know we um, we uh, <laughs> our current president is a bright orange man who speaks at a low scream and gold plates everything he possibly can Respectability politics is dead. People respect what they perceive to be boldness, boldness and fearlessness. And Vermin has been showing that for decades. Uh, Chris, when I was in uh, New Hampshire with Vermin back in February, uh, the New Hampshire primaries, we would go into events for Democratic presidential candidates like Tulsi Gabbard, like Andrew Yang, uh, like Bernie Sanders, uh, who ended up winning there. Uh, we would go and the a good portion of the crowd would be more interested to engage with vermin than with the actual candidate that they were there to support. They're there wearing, you know, Tulsi pins and, and Yang pins and everything else. They're choosing to talk with vermin and to take selfies with vermin and to engage with vermin and to tweet about vermin. And we saw that over and over and over again. We saw that what, at the Tulsi campaign, the Tom Steyer campaign had six people there, but they had the best food. Uh, but then we went to, um, we went to, uh, the Yang event right after he dropped out and we picked up quite a few of his social media team. Uh, they were there, you know, uh, mourning that he had just dropped out. 
And we showed up and, and, you know, Vermin did on the Yang stage, did his shtick and a bunch of people signed up. We actually got people to sign up for the New Hampshire Libertarian Party there. We went to the Bernie event right after he was announced the winner. And as he was giving the speech, we walked in and I was holding a pony head on a stick and holding it up like, uh, you know, like a, like a mace or something like that to announce the arrival of our next president. And people were jumping off of the bleachers by the hundreds to talk to Vermin during Bernie's victory speech. Vermin Supreme has a level of credibility and popularity that not only no other candidate in the Libertarian Party has, but that the Libertarian Party itself doesn't even have. It's Vermin who is putting himself out there and taking the potential credibility hit of saying, yeah, I'm with a, an actual serious party this time around, and I'd like you to take a look at this party that the Libertarian Party in 49 years of existence hasn't won a single statewide or federal election. 49 years, that is, uh, what, 12 election cycles or 12 presidential election cycles in 20, uh, what, 24 uh, 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 total election cycles, including midterms. Not one. I think at this point, it's safe to say that we can potentially do, yes, this is a very severe deviation from the strategy of of how you present a respectable politician which again i think in the age of trump and even before then is 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 dead we have i would say a potential that you know yes this is a deviation but it's i would say a deviation at, we can try that once i think we can try when we've had a 0% success rate at both the statewide and federal level i'd say we can we could shoot for something different and and i think that the hubris that it takes uh for us and i say this with all all due respect to the people that i'm crapping on right now but i think that the hubris that it takes for us to talk about the you know respectability and we could lose everything when our high water mark is 3.25 percent after nearly 50 years of trying to get into the public consciousness and effectively not even moving the needle we actually proudly say to people who say you're stealing the vote from donald trump we go well actually we, we take a little from both and we really haven't changed enough to to to, to you know to to take to, to cost the election for anyone. That's not something to be proud of. The fact that we aren't even a factor in national politics is nothing to be proud of. And the idea that we should continue to be Charlie Brown to, to the media and government systems, Lucy with the football, every single damn election cycle, we go and they go, oh, well, if you give us a nice respectable person in a suit who, you know, who gives us nice sound bit quips, uh, we'll be sure to, to, you know, give you a chance this time. And we go, okay. And we run to, to, to go and kick the football and they pull it out from under us every single time with these Aleppo gotcha moments. And then we go, Oh, I can't believe I fell for that again. We better find someone next time that's, you know, uh, similar so we can do that all over again. It's not going to work. They're not going to give us equal footing. The FEC is not going to give us equal footing. The state election boards that right now are trying to completely shut us out of the process by telling us that we have to get uh, a ballot access at a time that you're not allowed to leave your house with petitions. They're not going to give us a fair chance. The only way that we're going to break through and have any kind of being able to move the needle on the national level or even the state level is to completely subvert their system, use their system against us. And the only way you can do that is with the kind of nonlinear messaging that Vermin has been using as someone who prior to this, he's the most well-known candidate and he never even, his runs before consisted of him hanging out and trolling people for a week or so in New Hampshire every four years. And he is head and shoulders above the other candidates in terms of the knowledge of him and, and, and perception of him and his popularity, especially with the exact kind of voters who have them are the most likely to consider voting third party. In my mind, in my mind, it's a no brainer. But even if you don't think it's a no brainer, in my mind, looking at our success rate so far, which is literally zero. And again, not just for president, for Congress, for Senate, for governor, for any kind of any of the statewide race, not one statewide race, not one federal election. I would say at this time we can try, you know, Gary said, try being libertarian with me one time. We're saying try the free ponies angles with us one time. We see the popularity of it. Go on Twitter right now. No one is saying with Bernie dropping out, I'm voting for one of the other candidates. And I have tremendous respect for most of the other candidates. But they're not saying I'm voting for. There's a few. There's a few. Spike. There, there's, there's a few. There's, there's a, few. a few. Full disclosure. There's Full disclosure. A there's a couple that I, I don't want to vouch for. But no one is saying well, I'm going to vote. I'm happy to. <laughs> no, 
box. You, you're you are welcome to, but no one is saying I'm going to vote for these other candidates. They're saying I'm going to vote for Vermin. I'm going to vote for Vermin. I'm going to vote for Vermin. I'm going to write in Vermin because again, they're not saying I can't wait for the Libertarian Party to put up someone that I can vote for. They're saying I'm voting for Vermin, and if Vermin's not the candidate, I'm going to write him in. I think there's a potential that we have a situation where Furman didn't get it. Even if he actively encouraged people to vote for the libertarian candidate, he'd still get more votes as a write-in than the actual libertarian candidate. This is an incredible opportunity. This isn't about can the libertarian party afford That's to take a hit. That's a little hyperbole to me, Spike. I, I, it, it might be. I, it might be, but this is my opinion. Okay. I, this is not a campaign I opinion. opinion. I just wanted to let you know I felt it was a little bit of hyperbole. That's okay. <laughs> I personally think that's the case. Well, this is not um, I think one way to prove a little bit um, is there's a new contest that's going on right now um, that is recruiting new members and um, getting soliciting donors using specific candidate links. And as I'm looking at the graph, um, a new one will come out here in about five minutes. It looks like Vermin has more than all the other candidates combined. And I feel like that is an important metric because that's bringing in new people. These aren't people that are already in the party. Let's be real. We're libertarians. We're going to vote for whoever the libertarian candidate is, no matter what. Right. We, we need to get new people in. And Vermin has, I mean, I think he's, yesterday he was at 60 um, new members in just a few days. True. And that was double than more than all the other candidates combined. Yep. Yep. Why do you guys think you're doing so well in that contest? Well, just, you know, well, uh, just, just we're, you know, sharing the link, essentially. Uh, just sharing the link. And, uh, effort. You know, effort. Pretty much it, really. Just uh, you know, share, sharing the link, and uh, and uh, and it's a passive uh, post that people respond to, and um, you know, they, they uh, yeah. I mean, we, we we haven't been pushing it super hard or anything, but you know, uh, we we've haven't certainly been to. sharing it. Certainly been sharing it, and yep. uh, yeah, I think that's another indicator. Like, not even really pushing it, and people are just like, okay, and and, and then when they become members. They're not just becoming, they're not just signing the pledge. They have to actually pay dues. They have to yep. pay $25. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. these are people um, paying $25 to, uh, to become a member of a party just purely based on vermin. And, and I don't even get a cut of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and see, like helping... some people who have the links, you know, they get a cut of it, but it's a uh -oh. candidate. No, I, I can't get, I can't wait till I'm not a candidate anymore. Then, then, then some of these state committees will get to pay me for coming and being a speaker and shit. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Chrissy, may I be obliged to have one more question? Yes, you can. I want to answer what my favorite snack is. Um, <laughs> I hear you have two podcasts. <laughs> what are your podcasts, by the way? Oh, my podcast. Oh, you want to talk to me? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um. So my favorite snack is smoked salmon, and uh, the uh. Uh, the uh, my shows are called uh, the Muddy Waters of Freedom, which is on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern uh, time, and uh, my fellow Americans, which is Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, um, on Muddy Waters Media. I've been doing them since summer of 2018, uh, and they've been an absolute blast. and uh, And I absolutely love doing it. That's how I met Vermin. Was I had him on my show in I should probably remember the month. I think October. I think October. I think it was October, I September, love, October. I love all your all your social media stuff. So I'm excited to meet the guy behind Muddy Waters Media. I follow you on everything. Oh, cool. Well, um, it's so me. Well, I me and Matt Wright. It's me and Matt Wright. I want to ask uh, the two of you. There was an, an announcement today in Reason that Gary Johnson's 2012 running mate, uh, Judge Gray, is getting in the race with his vice presidential candidate of Larry Sharp. That's obviously a very big uh, ticket. And then Justin Amash, literally moments ago. Uh, a co-host of the show with much smaller boobs than mine uh, texted this photo to me. Uh, Hannah Cox tweeted, please be... Uh, so Donald Trump literally said this out loud. Uh, when somebody's president of the United States, the authority is total, and that's the way it's got to be. He said a lot of really dumb stuff today in that press conference. And Justin yeah. Amash tweeted, Americans who believe in limited government deserve another option. Hannah asked, please be you. And he said, thanks. I'm looking at it closely this week. So... There's a possibility that Justin Amash gets in this race and uh, you've got Judge Jim Gray now. So what are your reactions to these two new competitors to the race? Well, I will say that I wish we were still doing the live convention circuit because I would certainly love to be on stage and, and uh, enjoying those uh, 
those folks in the debate. And of course, uh, you know, uh, the candidate club is, is a very fun club. It's a very nice club, very congenial club. And uh, on the circuit, we've always gone out of our, our way to, to get along and uh, speak highly of whatever uh, other whenever possible. And um, I, I think that's a, a beautiful thing. Uh, my campaign is certainly, uh, I've certainly encouraged it to be the most uh, positive campaign possible. Got your slips here and there, but, uh, you know, libertarians, what are you going to do, right? Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I, I certainly welcome uh, um, Larry and Judge Gray to the race. I think they will make a, a fine addition. I, I am, and you, you am I, I try and be as truly politic and circumspect as I possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please recognize I, me for my politeness. <laughs> how do you feel about running against Larry Sharp, Spike? Yeah, I mean, you know, Larry's been an, uh, a big part of the movie. Larry's movement. going down! Larry's <laughs> going down! Spike Larry 2020. I listen or or hashtag Spike Larry. Um, no, I listen. I I don't have anything negative to say about Larry. Larry's been a a, a big part of the movement. I think it was. Um, you know, I was very happy to see everything he did during his New York gubernatorial gubernatorial race. And uh, yeah, I mean, I I'm glad to see uh, uh people entering the race. I mean, for a while it would look like it was just kind of me, and that was interesting. Uh, and, uh, so now having, you know, some more people that have been entering and, and, and running in, I think it's great. We can compare and contrast our different styles. We can potentially learn things from each other. Um, yeah, I, I'm also not really much of a mudslinger to begin with. I mean, even when, uh, Lincoln Chafee was in the race and I would talk about his voting record, I, I wouldn't, you know, attack him as much as just talk about the fact that we probably shouldn't have someone who votes for, you know, war and surveillance and everything <laughs> else and gun control and everything else to be our, uh, to be our nominee. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't really have anything negative to say about Larry and I, I look forward to, if I'm, we're allowed to leave our houses at some point, I'd love to actually, you know, meet him. So I, uh, I look forward to it. Uh, I have had a, a bunch of my supporters, uh, reach out to me to let me know that they're, you know, doubling down their support in, in, in light of it. That's actually how I found out it was happening, uh, earlier today when they said, oh, I don't care what Larry's doing, I'm supporting you. And I'm like, Hey, thanks. What's Larry doing? And, uh, and so, uh, so then I, I looked that up, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the more people that are in, the more choices that people have. I am confident that we have shown that if if the goal of a political party is to contest races as well as possible and to draw people into it and the broader movement that is behind it, that Vermin and I have demonstrated that we're the best path forward to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, delegates uh, will decide that if and when we're ever allowed to get together. Um, we will have a decision about, uh, you know, who they're going to pick, but, um, yeah, I mean, the, the libertarians have some great choices, uh, to pick from. I'm just the best one. <laughs> that was not like the spicy tea I wanted. I wanted you guys to say, fuck Larry. Cause, but I love, <laughs> of course we did. We know how this stuff works. Of yeah. course you want us to trash talk those people. It, 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 the art of the interview, Chrissy is noticing what they don't say. And notice that they didn't talk about Justin Amash. So it's what... Oh, <laughs> Justin Amash. No, no, I, no, oh, I yeah. forgot. He's a real politician, so I, I have no problem dis you know, jumping into his... I mean, gosh, <laughs> you fucking break. That dude, police. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, I'm sorry. I didn't bring him up because I forgot about him that quickly. Um, no, the thing is, here's the thing Here's the thing with, 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 with Justin Amash. We have been hearing him say for quite some time that he's thinking about this. And he may or, or may not do it, but I also, again, I have nothing negative to say about him. I'm not sure if he's ever uttered the Libertarian Party name, despite some people in the party throwing their panties at him for several years now. Um, but I don't know what to tell you. I mean, he may or may not jump in. I think at this point, it's a little bit of an insult, uh, uh, potentially, to, to be saying, oh, hey, you know, next month, uh, I'd like to be your candidate. Um, but, you know, that's me. I don't know what to tell you. So um, to kind of bring up a little bit of more topical stuff, um, how would the Supreme Spike Cohen ticket uh, handle this, the whole coronavirus thing? Oh, well, it, well, that's very simple. Number one, we would make uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 against the law. Yeah. Essentially, we would do <laughs> COVID free zones, yeah. COVID-19 and create COVID-19 zones. And if we find you in possession of a, of COVID nineteen, yeah. uh, you will be uh, appropriately dealt with. Yeah. Um, number two, going to go back in time 
and kill baby coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and number three, I am going to build a, a microscopic microbial antiviral wall around <laughs> our great nation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and perhaps even a moat of Purell. <laughs> yeah. Listen, if you have to, if you're going to infect people in this country, you have to go through the legal process. We are a nation of laws and we are going to set up a very robust, like our ancestors uh, viruses used to have to do when they came here legally, the right way and respecting our culture. And, you know, that's that's what we got to do. And I think that, you know, some of the uh, bleeding heart pinkos in our party have suggested going back in time and just raising coronavirus to be a better person. I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> and I think that, you know, it's a virus. How do you even raise it? You have to kill it. You have to kill it. Would you, and, even, give vi would you even give a pony to virus criminals? To virus criminals? Yeah, well, you know, yeah, I mean, ponies part. are actually a natural anti-vector to coronavirus. Right. I'm, 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 I'm saying that now. Um once we perfect the shrink rays, yeah, they're going to get very, very small. And it will be an epic and uh, and broad-based battle, a literal battle between ponies and coronavirus. <laughs> so speaking of ponies. Wait, wait, wait. Um, which would win in a fight? 50 little coronaviruses or 50 <laughs> big, one big pony? That's, well, I think, the question. Well, we also have a badger. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking of ponies, um, Vermin and Spike, uh, what would you name your ponies? Well, since I'm getting the first pony, I get to name it Tony. <laughs> Tony the Tony pony. Tony the pony. He just stole my name. Now I got to think of a new name. Crap. Um, <laughs> you haven't been Tony. thinking about this stuff for months, Spike. It was Tony. Um. Uh, was Tony. Oh, oh, baloney. Macaroni the pony. <laughs> I like that better. So, can you guys, um, for our friend Chris here, who uh, doesn't understand? The joke. Can you guys kind of explain pony-based economics? I believe that I will attempt to explain uh, pony-based uh, economics. Yes. All right. It goes a little like this. Once everybody has their ponies, once we have accomplished universal pony ownership, then we will possess equity in the ponies that we own. Now, once you have equity in something, as you very well know, you can use that to borrow against it. And so you will be able to borrow against the equity in your pony. Essentially, we will be creating a class of pony-based debt. Now, once we firmly establish pony-based debt, then we will be able to bring in the brightest and the smartest of all the Ivy League schools, and they will begin to set to work on creating the most opaque and incredibly difficult to understand uh, pony-based financial instruments that you could even possibly uh, begin to imagine. And yes, the answer to your question is we do intend on creating a pony-based bubble in the economy. Now, as you know, bubbles are great things to have in your economy uh, when they are occurring. It means the economy is going full throttle, firing on all eight cylinders. Everybody's making money. Wall Street's tap dancing on air. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, many bubbles will indeed burst. But this bubble is going to expand bigger and bigger and get incredibly large. And uh, it will never, ever explode. And I'll tell you why. Because it is going to be steel belted and reinforced and last <laughs> forever so that it's a magic because, bubble it's a magic because, bubble. you know some people say vermin are you going to use are we literally going to be using ponies as currency and i say no that's absolutely ridiculous until we can make them really really small pony coin yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i i feel like Chris, do you smoke weed? No. That's, oh, I, okay, I totally understand that. <laughs> That's why you don't get this. No, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't own a gun. I'm like, I'm the most uptight libertarian. You don't own a gun? What the fuck? Who are you, Sam Gold? How did they even allow your membership? You don't own a gun? <laughs> Sam they made me show a picture of my gun before I could even sign up. 
Sam was my boss, so that's why I am the way I am. Uh, so don't don't worry, Dustin Nana is right behind you, buddy. Uh, I want to know: Does your head get hot in the hat? Does it? Like I've always wondered this about you. Does no, my brain bake? Is that what you're asking? But like it's like the vinyl is it rubber? Like your your boot? Like is it? Does it get hot in there? It's actual rubber, and I have worn it worn it in some very temperate climates over the years. Uh, 2012 tam- uh, at the uh, RNC uh, was in Tampa, and it was very hot and very humid. And yes, one of these years I will uh, equip it with equip uh, with a thermometer, and then we'll get some accurate readings. I do enjoy when uh, you say that you've outlasted a candidate in the race. I laugh every single time. <laughs> no, Thank, you. Thank you. It's very funny, and I also enjoy that. Uh, what what did I do? Uh, so I have a knife. Uh, so I have this buck knife, and I wanted to know, if I trade this in, will you give me a better buck knife, or do I get a gun? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I mean, 100%. 100%. 100%. I'm warming, I'm warming up here. I'm just going to be honest with you. Yeah. No, you get a lot of stuff. Our campaign gives a lot of things, which is surprising for a libertarian campaign. <laughs> uh, we're popular, and we promise free stuff, oddly enough. Um, but we, yeah, you get a pony. Um, your pony will be uh, uh, retrofitted with a 20 millimeter Vulcan cannon. Uh, any weaponry that you have uh, will be replaced with better weaponry and more weaponry. Uh, we also give you free cheesy bread with the uh, purchase of any federal explosives permit. We will be legalizing recreational plutonium once the zombies are providing us with all the power that we need uh, by putting them on giant hamster wheels and dangling brains in front of them in perpetuity. Uh, the next question becomes, well, what are we going to do with all of these nuclear power plants uh, that are going Going offline. What are we going to do with all this plutonium? And the answer, of course, is whatever the hell you want. It's your body. Just stay away from us for the rest of thir- for the next thirty five thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, can we can we get Chris some weed so he can just understand? Because, like, I feel like that's all that's missing for Chris. Well, so I'm actually, I'm actually a, uh, um, uh, I've been sober for about fourteen years now, but I wasn't sober like really heavily not sober for many years before that. So I'm permanently damaged from that. Um, and it shows every I day. I feel you need to be high to understand sarcasm. I get it. <laughs> Are you well, high right now? Thankfully, a, a large number of people do. Yeah. Thankfully, a large number of people do. And uh, I, if you know, if you do Google metrics or, or anything like that, you just like uh, compare the, the analytics to uh, myself and any, uh, current candidate uh, in the race or or against any number of things really and uh i don't know it, it's a uh, pretty surprising how famous i am for people who seem to claim to the contrary that i'm unknown outside the party um uh we've been doing this for a, a very long time and um you know once again a, a lot of uh, it operates on many levels and I, I think that's something that that needs to be understood too and and i think that most people understand uh, that when we are, you know, referencing one thing, we are, are clearly referencing another and, uh, you know, having just so much fun with it and lampooning it and offering a way of looking at things that just isn't uh, presented uh, often enough. And uh, we are just and one of the beauties of uh, of what it is that I've developed and created includes that, um, you know, I offer we, we extend the opportunity for adults to pretend a little bit. They like to pretend and yeah. we give them this opportunity and they're more than happy to play along with it, even though they know full well that they're never going to get their pony or cheesy bread or badger or, or anything. Wait, it, what? <laughs> don't tell anyone. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I, a lot no, of times. Not you. You're I'm getting your pony. pony. You, I, I you were getting your pony. Relevant campaign promises is, is that uh, it's all I will lie to you. I have no reason not to. Uh, you know, <laughs> things you know it's up front you you will you get nothing you know vermin supreme reserves the right to de- deny everything and you get nothing it's right I find, up it, here. I find it really cool that you know when you talk about like adults get to pretend um i actually didn't even tell my son about you uh my son is avid on tiktok he actually just turned 14 today uh so he's a huge happy tiktoker birthday. happy you. birthday I'm, I'm to you happy birthday to- I'm trying to find him so he can say hi, but he's outside because when mommy does her show, <laughs> boy goes outside. Um, so, but anyway, he's really, he's really big on, on this whole TikTok shit. And uh, he actually showed me, he's like, mom, look, 
I think this guy said he's a libertarian. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's Vermin Supreme. And he's like, that's... the the same Vermin Supreme? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, oh, wow, you guys are a lot cooler than I thought. And I was like, what? my son has been going yeah. to events for his entire life and never thought I was cool. And let so me, I told him. Let me tell you a couple things in defense of Vermin Supreme, because I found this to be an enlightening conversation and uh, and gained a newfound respect for you. I will say from lessons from the Rupert campaign, Rupert and I talk all the time about how we did it the wrong way. And that was putting him in the suit, trying to trying to make him fit into the political norms. You know, we were we were two years before Donald Trump started running or three years. We ran against Mike Pence, you know, and it, we we thought too much about what the local political establishment wanted, what they thought was important, trying right. to get those people that were never going to vote for us anyways. We would have done it differently. Uh, and and if he ever ran again, we would we would I mean, Trump just completely changed everything. So I do think in that respect, it does it does make sense. And I do understand what you're saying. And I do get the joke. I do think that it's I think, Vermin, you know this. You've run for office before. You've been around a long time. It, for for the people that support you, they may not realize how actually hard it is and how uh, how once you get to a certain level and you're the candidate, there's a lot of people that were supporters that change or or that political establishment. You know, Spike, you're, you're very eloquent and, you know, you, you spoke so eloquently about how... Oh, well, three percent isn't a big deal, but that structural advancement from one to three percent gained ballot access for so many different states. And if you don't execute the joke the right way, you then move us backwards in all those state legislatures, and they start. They go, well, this isn't even a serious political party. So it's incumbent on your campaign and on you guys and on your supporters to execute it the right way. So I think it it. It is very Absolutely. it is very appealing, but there is a lot of danger because that the the reality is the structural we have straight ballot access here or straight ticket voting here in Indiana, and that's just a killer. That's that's a structural thing that we are trying to change and work with the legislature every single year and have for ten years, and we start we're starting to get some advancement. But if you come in at the top of the ticket and and they don't get the joke, well, then that moves us even further back. Well, this, uh, well once again, this will require uh, strategies. And um, I have repeatedly stated that I'm more than uh, happy to interface and integrate and uh, welcome the, the input of the uh, LNC itself uh, during the, the general if I were to be uh, selected the nominee. Um, people like yourself, I, I would hope to pull pull into the campaign uh, for such for just such advice and strategy sessions. Um, you know, there, there's a, an amazing talent pool uh, within the LP, and it will indeed uh, take us all uh, take all of us dedicated to essentially owning the joke and uh, and uh, moving forward with it and and using it for all it's worth. But once again, using its potential as an, an attention getter, eye opener. Uh, foot in the door before uh, giving the hard sell. I mean, you know, it, it's always good to start with a laugh. And yes, uh, I imagine there there will be explaining because you know, even the last election, uh, there there was a meme that went around. Uh, there was a, a picture of me at the at one of the debates uh, with the boot on the head. Uh, I think up in New Hampshire, and um, not a libertarian debate, but a, a classic uh, vermin clip. Uh, and it went out there with the phrase, this is what Bernie Sanders looks like to sane people and it <laughs> around the Internet. It bounced. I mean, it, it got huge play in, in the right sphere of the Internet. And then uh, it boomeranged and came back and it was retitled. This is what uh, Trump looks like to sane people. And it bounced around as, as a viral meme. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, in previous years, you know, yes, as a meme, uh, the message can uh be used like that, but I, I believe that we can use it and utilize it to uh, to push push the liberty and libertarianism forward uh, to places it's never been, and um, and bring in a lot of people who uh, might not be coming to the party. I mean, I can say uh, with full on uh, certainty that just my mere uh, 
affiliation uh, with the party and, and working with the party on this level. And, and of course, you know, I, I run for president. That's what I do. It's what I've done for 30 years. It shouldn't be a, a huge surprise. But um, I believe I've been trying to convince the party that I'm not out to troll the party. I mean, yes, we'll troll America and the duopoly together. Um, but that is uh, that's part of the part and part 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 and parcel of the entire offer. Thank right. You. Yeah. I mean, it, if you look at where the majority of of people get their news, it's from humorous sources, late night news, The Daily Show, Donald Trump's tweets, Me um, memes like the yeah you yeah i'm sorry we are libertarians if you look at where people are getting their the muddy waters of, of muddy waters media if you look at where people are getting their news they're trying to find humor a, a, someone who's presenting it in a humorous way and the reason that they're doing that is because a things are scary right now and uh, sort of always and and are presented as doom and gloom by by you know establishment media but also because the most powerful way that you can lower people's cognitive defenses and get them to actually listen to what you have to say is through humor. If you present it as a humorous thing, look at the George Carlin routines. He would start with silly jokes and, and, and funny humor and about somewhere between around halfway, two thirds of the way in, he's not even telling punchlines anymore. He's just dropping, uh, you know, anti-establishment, uh, uh, agit prop basically and getting applause lines from his from from the people watching every once in a while he drop in a, a you know a, a humorous note or a or a, a punchline just to keep them you know engaged and then he'd typically end it with humor as well but those were political things that he did those were basically political speeches he gave that were sandwiched and couched in humor and he's not the only comedian to do it he's just the first one that came to mind but we're essentially doing the same thing we're using humor to get into spaces that no other candidate, no other third party candidate, and even even you know the the, the Republican candidates can't truly get into. I mean, think about the fact that uh, in the last presidential election, something like forty six percent of eligible voters, people who were already eligible and registered to vote, didn't vote because they looked at the options that they knew they had and said, "Yeah, no, none of this is worth getting off my couch." And, and going to, you know, a polling location on a Tuesday uh, or even right or even, you know, filling out an absentee ballot and and, and, fill, and and sending that in. It's not worth my time. They're all lying to me. The entire system is a joke. What an opportunity for us to say, yeah, the system is a joke. So let's hand them a clown. Instead of you being the punchline this year, let's turn around and make the entire system a punchline. And that's why it's been so appealing. That is why uh, Vermin and I have almost twice as many uh, signups in this recruitment contest as all of the other candidates combined. It's not because they're not so trying so far. So, so far so far plenty of time till it's over so, so far um we're we're at around an hour and we're about to get to final words but kaden came in and i wanted to introduce kaden to vermin and spice and it's his birthday happy, happy birthday birthday kid they look happy really great happy i'm happy. actually look kaden i'm cool i got vermin supreme on my show how would a vermin supreme administration celebrate birthdays well i would call up each and every American, all 300 million of them on their birthday, and I would sing to them. And uh, yes, it would go something like this. Thank you. Caden, <laughs> um, how was your birthday song? Uh, great. <laughs> now he's gonna go tell all of his friends he got to meet vermin supreme and got sang to for his birthday got serenaded yeah high five to the camera Boom. <laughs> all right guys um since we're out about an hour um is there any last words before we go anything you'd like to tell the chris and jesse audience or the chris and chrissy audience whoever the fuck we are tonight chris and chris, chrissy chris chris and chris. i'd like to uh, say to chris i mean what, what uh, you should understand about uh, what it is that i do is it, it is a communication strategy and it's a key communication strategy that um you know it does include simple elegant and effective methods and true the, the boot and the the crazy uh, platform planks uh for that but they've been wildly wildly successful and I, I believe that we can utilize it. I mean, you must ask yourself, can we use uh, humor as a weapon against the duopoly? Can we use a, a humor as a weapon against the status quo? Can we get humor to uh, grow the party? And uh, my answer is most certainly yes to, to all of those questions and more.
more random questions. I the, tagline, the tagline to my podcast since 2012 has been all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. So I'm, I get it. I'm in on the joke now. Thank you for enlightening me. Yeah. No, 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 thank you. And, and, and I, and I ask for your assistance and, uh, you know, now that you can conceptually grok it in, uh, in helping us phrase it or, or, or be able to, you know, explain it in a simple forward manner to, uh, to people who disagree. But like as you did previously, until we at least presented our case. So um, I would appreciate that. Just, hey, you guys, this was actually a ploy. Um, Jess could have totally done this whole thing. We just knew Chris was a hater, so this was ah, a perfect. <laughs> perfect. And Chris, I would like to say, Chris, between not getting it and being a hater, I, you know, there's there's other candidates in this race where I'm a hater. Trust me. <laughs> yes, Mike. Well, I just would like to say I resent that we didn't have more opportunities to talk about my favorite snacks, and hopefully we can address that when Jess is the is the co-host. But we, anyway, we whatever. Almost, I'm not bitter. No, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. We almost. But, we also missed. What was your longest road trip? My oh, longest right. road trip was and, to tr driving to New Hampshire and then back after getting coronavirus in New Hampshire. How many lawsuits have you filed in your life, and why? Three. So sued the NYPD successfully. Sued the uh, LAPD. Well, not successfully, but settled. And uh, had to sue the city, uh, the t city of Concord, New Hampshire, in order to have ponies uh, <laughs> protest Hillary Clinton's uh, book signing tour. And then uh, I don't know if we have time for the history of activism rainbow gathering. God, no. No, we definitely. <laughs> hey, stop talking shit about my questions, bro. Uh, <laughs> Just, uh, I was really uh, stoned when I put those I, together. Okay. I, 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 would, <laughs> I, would, I would. I would. I would suggest and and request that you uh, watch the documentary "Who Is Vermin Supreme." I will. On Vimeo. I mean, it really will let you know where I come from, from, uh, f from my uh, career, what I've been doing for forever. Yes. Well, and if you, you guys. if oh, you want, if if you want to uh, join us, if you're in on the joke, if you're hashtag in on the joke now too, uh, be sure to go to verminsupreme2020.com. Uh, you can buy. We have new merch in the store. Be sure to buy lots of sweet, sweet vermin supreme merch. Uh, Is this not the coolest fucking candidate shirt you've ever seen? It's very cool. Is and it only it only gets better from there. Yeah. Yep, Vermin, Vermin Supreme uh, 2020.com. You can donate to, to us. You can donate to us with crypto. Give us some of that Bitcoin you've been hodling. And uh, and uh, if you want to join the team and, and, and sign up and volunteer, be sure to contact us on our forum. We are on all social media. So if you're looking yeah. for either Vermin Supreme or me on social media, simply look for Vermin Supreme. I don't think we're on Snapchat, are we? You're, I'm not. You might be. Not yet. I mean, there's people who use my name for sure. <laughs> no, I, I can guarantee that right now, if you go to Snapchat and type in my name, you'll find a dozen people who are using my name for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, the, but once again, Chris, understand, you know, the boot is not attached to my head. <laughs> oh, look, he took it off. I, I, am not my, I am not my character. I knew that there was I, performance I behind it. I, I was aware that there was performance. Like, I didn't think that you were a crazy person. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, I've met oh, him quite a few times. I've even smoked with him, and I still believe 100% he's a crazy person. There's too many. Crazy's a spectrum, first of all. Yeah. Um, there's there's a spectrum. Many, too many people I respect that take you very, very seriously and support your campaign. So it was just a matter of I hadn't gotten around to like once convention time rolls around, then I'll pay attention to the candidates, I guess. But, uh, you know, and so that is the only metric. Once again, I mean, I don't know these things, but because. I have so many principled libertarian representing the left and the right parts of the party. Um, I mean, that, that's the only way that I can tell it's real uh, because of the people who have uh, stepped up and uh, endorsed my campaign, you know, real libertarians. And, uh, you know, otherwise I would have to wonder, I, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. I was recruited into this role and uh, have developed uh, this, uh, this very large base of support within the party and some very, uh, I mean, a number of people whose opinion I respect uh, because I just don't know enough in order to uh, fully know uh, if, if it is the right thing to do. You know, if I wasn't me, I, I would have to question myself. <laughs> <laughs> because, but because I am me, I have no choice but well, to present it in the most positive light. Thank you. I'm Vermin Supreme. <laughs> a very reasonable man making a very reasonable offer. I am the pragmatist choice. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Chris, do you have any uh, last words? Yeah, just uh, thanks to everybody for listening. I really appreciate it. If 
you would wouldn't mind please go uh, download we are libertarians that's the podcast visit we are libertarians.com that's where the website's at it had a great episode that we just posted tonight and i would just say that if everybody could spend as much time calling their favorite nonprofit and uh, getting involved in the front lines of what's happening in your community as much time as you spend bitching online put that much effort into helping a nonprofit uh, I host uh, the public affairs show here in Indianapolis for our radio station cluster, and you cannot imagine the need that is happening in communities in terms of uh, suicide spikes, opioid spikes, food food security issues, child abuse. Like there is, you know, there's a, a local COVID shelter with 60 kids in it who who, who their guardians are in the hospital or have passed away, and they need clothes. Like. There is so much need happening right now, and libertarians need to be the group that step up and show that we're here to help. And I totally understand all of our concern with liberty and and what's happening. There's not much we can do about that, but we sure as heck can call up a nonprofit and say, can I give you money? Can I give you clothes? Can I give you some of my food stores? What can I do to help you? And that is truly how we're going to change the world. That is truly something we can empower uh, our communities in that's a direct response that we can have that we can feel good about and uh so awesome because you sound like exactly what i like to say to my people on my podcast yep exactly yeah yep. i think we're all i think we are so on the same page in that we're talking about uh mutual aid and volunteerism and and charity and and uh and love and compassion and uh that's the only thing that's going to see us through this mess for sure yep. so, uh, there's so, so much I, I appreciate there's that, Chris. I, I so much appreciate that you uh that you put voice to those sentiments also Yes, Absolutely. thank you. Okay, this is way too much like kindness and love for Shut my up, show. Wait, I want to say I love people. No, I want to talk about how much I love people now too, since everyone else has. Um, when <laughs> when people ask without government, who's going to do whatever? Help people after disasters. Help people during pandemics. Help people that are poor and suffering. The answer should not only be we will, but demonstrating that we're doing it and actually putting our ideas into action as much as we possibly can what a perfect way to do that to help help others not just because we should be helping others and want to help others and that's why we're doing what we're doing but also to it helps with our message that we don't need government government makes it worse and we're here cleaning up after government's mess um so no i am very thankful that 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 came up um, I, I don't know if the three of you feel this way but i feel that libertarians sometimes are overly fearful of government and they need some place to channel some of that anxiety and like i just feel like this is the place where people need to get involved. They can if put your efforts into that. Like the Libertarian Party is really important. All this stuff is really important, but you're probably not going to change the system in overnight. That's a gradual thing. But this is something, man, where a bag of food. I mean, they're having a really hard time at some of these food shelters here in Indianapolis yeah. And, yeah. And, and just buying food. And so it's going to be some really hard time for a lot of people for, for a, perhaps a long time. And uh, yeah. Yeah, we have to try and do what we can and propagandize them at the same time, of course. Yeah, <laughs> actually, we had a really good idea um, before our state got completely locked down to um, serve uh, a lot of the children that were on the free lunch program, right. serve them lunches from our Libertarian Party headquarters. I've been giving, um, shout out, I've been giving shout outs to that program uh, at debates and on podcasts, and uh, it's definitely getting shout outs from me. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's it, we just thought it's such a good idea. And um, why not slip a couple uh, libertarian things in there for their parents to read? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really, really happy you stayed on. Um, feel free to stay on after I end this broadcast and Jess can come on and chat with you for a minute. Um, thank you. You guys are so great. I know I see your eggs. Um, they look like great eggs. Put uh, your eggs away, Spike. The broadcast right, is over. I just wanted to show my eggs. I'm sorry. You, okay. Th those are beautiful eggs. Uh, <laughs> Um, which no one's ever said to me. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a beautiful boot, uh, beautiful eggs, uh, Chris, beautiful boobs, um, and me, beautiful curly hair. So now that we're all feeling super, uh, filled up with our ego, I love you all. And, uh, thank you again for joining us. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks for coming.